Greetings, and welcome to Etzheim's weekly podcast, recorded live in Richardson, Texas. We invite you now to join us for one of our synagogue's Shabbat messages. Okay, we on? You're okay? All right. Well, tomorrow, as you know, actually beginning to sundown tonight is what's called Tisha B'Av, which means the ninth day of the month of Av on the Jewish calendar, which is a very sad day, a solemn day, when we commemorate the destruction of both temples on this very same day. Uh, now, the temple and the sacrificial system were God's means of atonement, God's means of forgiveness of our sins. Uh, for the scriptures say this in, in Leviticus 17.11, uh, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it's the blood that makes atonement for your soul. And as Hebrews 9.22 comments on this verse, it says, For without the shedding of blood... There is no forgiveness of sins. Well, as you know, the, the, temple, the second temple was destroyed in the year 70 AD. So what do we do without a temple and without blood sacrifices? How do we make atonement then for our sins? Well, as you also know, this was the whole reason the Messiah Yeshua came. Uh, to be our once and for all final atonement. Through his death and resurrection on our behalf, he becomes our ultimate sin sacrifice and atonement. And this is beautifully summed up all in one verse, which is the whole message today. This is this, basically this one verse, 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So today, in honor of the ninth of Av, in honor of Tisha B'Av, and, 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 and Yeshua being our final atonement, I want us to unpack this verse very carefully and, and really meditate upon it. Because I think today our, that, that is our greatest need. We need a higher and deeper and wider and more exalted view of Messiah and what he did for you. In these last days, more than ever, we need to see Yeshua. And so we cry out to the Lord. Lord, consume my heart more and more of Messiah. Give me today a, a new vision of him. Uh, ravish my heart with a greater understanding of who Yeshua is and, and what he's done for me. They would overwhelm and fill my soul uh, and pour out of me with love and adoration and worship and joy, uh, an unquenchable desire to share this love with others as an overflow of my heart. Again, the entire gospel is encapsulated in this one verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that if we are in him, we might become the righteousness of God. And this truth, Messiah becoming sin for us, this is the crown jewel, uh, the most important of all concepts. You know, people love to spend a lot of time speculating all about eschatology and about the second coming of Messiah. But I assure you, with regard to eschatology and then the second coming of Messiah, you will know everything you need to know the day he returns. But you'll be an eternity of eternities in glory and still not have reached the foothills of the Everest of the atonement of the gospel of Yeshua. Because the depths of the gospel are inexhaustible. Niebuhr told this in 1 Peter uh, 1.10, concerning this salvation and the sufferings of Messiah and the glories that would follow, even the angels long to look at these things. Our knowledge uh, and appreciation and understanding of the gospel will go on and on and on for all eternity as we gaze into his glory, as we contemplate what God has done for us in Messiah Yeshua. And this is the cure for every malady we may have. So I want us to go today into the heart of the gospel, uh, take a deeper look at this verse. And as you put, the gospel, uh, put this gospel first, everything else will be set in place. But we can't understand the gospel, we can't understand uh, this text in 2 Corinthians 5.21, until we first understand how vile sin is. And we can't understand how vile sin is until we first understand 
who God is. Because you, you can argue with men all day long and try to show them how evil their sin is, but they won't see it until you first show them who God is in his absolute holiness and righteousness and justice. And only then will they be able to see in comparison what they are not. So when you share your faith, first reveal God to people. And then they'll see their sin and how far short they fall and what the Lord demands of us and how we should live. Because in shining the light of who God is, every dark spot will be revealed. All of our evil thoughts and the intentions of our heart will be laid bare. All of our selfishness and lust uh, and resentment and, and jealousy, our greed, our pride, our unforgiveness. And so we are confronted, we'll put this on the overhead, we're confronted with this great dilemma, the dilemma, which is really the story, the story of the whole Bible. The great question of all scripture is this, how can God be just and yet justify the wicked? How can he forgive our countless sins and cleanse our, our evil hearts? How can he do this? The whole scripture can be seen as trying to answer this one question. Turn with me, for example, to Exodus 34, I'll put it on the overhead as well, where God speaks to Moses on Mount Sinai, Exodus 34, verse 6, and he describes himself, and he says, The Lord passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and kindness and truth, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he will not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of their parents, even to the third and fourth generation. Do you see the problem in this text? When it says the Lord forgives wickedness, rebellion, and sin, this is a Hebraic way of piling one different Hebrew term on top of another to say that God forgives all types and kinds of sins. But then the very same verse goes on to say, yet he'll by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Now, how can both of these be true? This is almost like a paradox. How can both be true? How can you have both things in the same verse? We see the same dilemma in Psalm 32, verse 1, where the psalmist says, David says, uh, Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is he whose sins the Lord does not count against him. When you read this, you say, praise the Lord. Until you read this verse in light of who God is. Because what it's saying is that God covers sin. But elsewhere we read that it's the corrupt earthly judges. But that's what they do. They cover up sins. So how can a holy and just God cover sin? How? And we see this dilemma with King David, for example. He, he was a murderer and an adulterer. He should die. And yet God spares him. Uh, Adam should have died, right? In the beginning, right? When he first ate from the fruit of the tree. In fact, we're all guilty, and thus we all should die if God is a just God. So how can he cover sin and still be just? The dilemma is summed up here in Proverbs 17, 15. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. And we get to Romans 3 and 4, we hear uh, the praises for what? for the fact that God justifies the wicked. God justifies the wicked and we praise him for it. For unless he does that, there is no hope for you or for me, for any of us. But here's the problem. It just says in the scripture, we just read it in Proverbs, the scriptures, and the scriptures cannot be broken. If anyone justifies the wicked, they're an abomination to the Lord. So how does the Lord do this, do this very thing? How does the Lord justify the wicked? This is the great question of the gospel. And yet a few people recognize or understand this central issue of the scriptures today. Let's go to Micah and begin to see part of the answer. Micah 7, verse 18. Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity, who passes over the rebellious acts uh, and, uh, and the remnant of his inheritance, of, of the remnant of his inheritance? He doesn't retain his anger forever because he delights in his unchanging love. He'll again have compassion on us. He'll tread our iniquities underfoot. 
Yes, he'll cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Did we sing songs about this, right? God treads our iniquities underfoot. Uh, he's removed our sins and cast them into the sea, in the depths of the sea. And we rejoice in this. But this makes no sense unless we see it through the lens of the person and the work of Messiah. God did not just arbitrarily remove your sin and trample it underfoot uh, and, and cast them into the sea. The, let's look next overhead. The, the answer to this dilemma is found in the gospel, which is this. God took your sin off of you and laid it upon his perfect, sinless son, Yeshua, and then trampled him underfoot of the wrath of God. God takes the sins off of those who repent and put their trust in Yeshua and his finished work on the tree, on the cross, and who submit their lives to him, to Yeshua as their Lord. So, so that if, you, if you're in Messiah Yeshua, God took his, your sins off of you and put them onto Yeshua and then cast Yeshua into the depths of the sea of his wrath. So that Yeshua took your punishment for you that you deserved. So the only way that God can be both just and the justifier of the wicked is because there was a ransom that was paid for you. There's a sacrifice so pure, so holy, so pleasing to God, it satisfies the demands of his justice. So in light of all this, let's look at our text, 2 Corinthians 5.21. He, he made him who knew no sin. Let's stop right there. Now when we read that Yeshua knew no sin... What do we think? Well, probably the first thing we think is he perfectly kept the law. Yes, that's true. But it is so much mightier than that. It's so much greater. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, what would you say is the greatest sin? The greatest sin. How about breaking the greatest commandment? The commandment to, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Now hear me well. There has never been a human being on this planet of all the thousands of years of humanity, of all the billions of people who have walked this earth, there's never been one person who for one second loved the Lord their God with all their heart and soul and mind and strength. Never. Think about it. Among the billions of Adam's seed, not even for one second have they loved the Lord their God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. And yet, in stark contrast, uh, for this Yeshua of Nazareth, there wasn't one second where he did not love the Lord his God with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength. He is absolutely amazing. Look to Yeshua. He's amazing. He's our victor. He's our conqueror, our champion. He did what none of us could do. None of us. And the book of Hebrews says in Hebrews 5.15, Yeshua was tempted in every way, just like we are. Yet he did not sin. Do we really understand this? Here's a simple little illustration. Imagine you standing beside me was a world-class power lifter. So you put an Olympic bar in his back, and those weighs 45 pounds. Uh, and you put the same, I put another bar on my back. Uh, I'm okay, he's okay. Now you put two 45 pound plates on each, at each side of the bar. So now there's 135 pounds on, on his back. And then you do the same for me. So we're both now told to squat this weight, this weight squat it down and lift it up again. Uh, and we're both okay. So now we have two more plates, one on each side. So now we both have 225 pounds on our back. And yeah, if I'm really try hard, I can squat that weight. <laughs> so I'm okay. For him, it's easy. Uh, now we had two more plates. Three on each side. Now it's 315 pounds. And I'm trembling. And I do not want to squat that weight down. Uh, because if I do, I'm not coming back up. <laughs> but he's just fine. Squatting 315, that's no big deal for him. Then we had two more plates. Now we're at 405 pounds. He's not even breaking a sweat. I've already quit. Or else I would have fallen to the ground and been crushed into a thousand pieces. 
Now the first temptation in the garden was laid upon the strongest of us. It was laid upon Adam. And in him we all crashed to the ground and were broken. But the temptation after temptation after temptation was heaped and heaped and heaped upon Yeshua. And he stood and he stood and he stood. What was heaped on him was infinitely beyond anything that, that touched a lot of us. And yet this broad-shouldered Messiah, this deep-chested Savior, stood his ground in every way. He is our champion. He is our king. He earned it by his own right and virtue. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He, he made him who knew no sin to be sin. And now what does that mean? Uh, that Yeshua was made sin. I want to answer this by looking at the whole verse again. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him who knew no sin uh, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The moment that you repented and believed in Yeshua with, with saving faith, did, you, you, did your nature instantly become transformed so that you become perfectly righteous? No. What happened to you when you were born again is that righteousness was imputed to you, meaning that you were legally or forensically declared to be right with God. And God therefore treated you as right with Him. The moment you put your saving trust in Messiah, you were legally declared to be right before the throne of God. And God treats you as right with Him. And even when you fall into sin and come under the loving discipline of God, it's still in the context of being treated as right with Him. If you're in Messiah, God disciplines you, not as a judge, but as a father. So how did Messiah become sin for us? On the tree, on the cross, our sins were imputed to him. And he's legally declared guilty. And he's therefore treated as, as such, as guilty. Yeshua is treated as guilty. Does that make you tremble? It should. For the perfectly holy God to treat the sinner as a sinner, when that alone is beyond terror. And no, this divine judgment, it's simply uh, the blinding white holiness of God manifested against evil. Yeshua became sin. He did not become sinful, but he was legally treated as such because all our sins were laid on him. And he became our sin bearer, our, our sin and guilt sacrifice offering. And this is hard for us to grasp. Why? Because we're, because we're conceived in sin. We're born in sin. Isaiah says we have sinful lips. We live among a people of sinful lips. We drink down iniquity as if it were, it were water. So how can we ever understand what it means for, for the holy, perfect Son of God, who's always known perfect communion with the Father, how can we know what it means for Him to become sin? I really couldn't come up with a, a good illustration, so here's a very pitiful very inadequate example. Imagine the finest, holiest, most innocent young woman here at Eskheim. And she decides she's going to go to have an outreach among the prostitutes of Dallas. And she is pure and as, and as innocent as any woman you've ever known. She's an awesome woman of God. And she goes out to win souls among, in the red light district uh, in, in, in Dallas. But as she's there passing out tracts, all of a sudden, the police come. And they grab all the prostitutes and they throw them in the paddy wagon. Uh, and because this dear sister, she, she's there with them, she inadvertently uh, gets grabbed and they throw her in the paddy wagon too. And they throw her in a holding cell along with the prostitutes at the city jail. Now in the jail cell, the prostitutes are all uh, on their cell phones. Uh, they're laughing, they're telling jokes, they're filing their nails. They've been through this a thousand times before. It's no big deal to any of them. But this dear sister, she's sitting over in the corner. She can hardly breathe. She's trembling, she's shaking. Her entire life you know, is dislocated and fractured. The police roughly handle them all, including her. They fingerprint her and photograph her, book her, accuse her of soliciting, lump her in with all the prostitutes. She's beside herself, practically hysterical. Again, this illustration doesn't even begin 
uh, to remotely accurately picture what it, was like, what it was like for Yeshua to take on your sins and mine. But perhaps it gives us the, the smallest of glimpses. Let's go on. The text says Messiah was made sin. And we think, when we think it can't get any darker than that, Paul takes us even further down into the dungeon. Look at Galatians 3.10. For as many as rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it's written, Cursed is anyone who doesn't abide by all the things written in the book of the law to perform them. Now what does it mean to be accursed? It means this. The sinner... That only before God, but before, also before every holy creature in heaven, the last thing this sinner will hear, he is so vile and so loathsome before God, the last thing he hears when he takes his first step into hell is all of heaven standing to his feet and applauding God because God has rid the earth of him. Now look at Galatians 3.13. Messiah redeemed us from the curse of the law, by becoming a curse for us, as it's written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Do you see what Messiah did for you here? He became a curse for you. This is the source of your salvation. This is the heart of the gospel. Uh, the mystery and the wonder of our redemption is wrapped up in this verse. He became sin. He became a curse. You know, in the Beatitudes, in the Sermon on the Mount, we have all these blessings listed, right? Uh, so what, what's a curse? Well, a curse would be the opposite of a blessing. So let me rewrite the Beatitudes into the opposite to, to see what a curse is. The blessed are granted the kingdom of heaven. The cursed are refused entrance. The blessed are comforted by God. The cursed are objects of divine wrath. The blessed inherit the earth. The cursed are cut off from the earth. The blessed are satisfied and filled. The cursed are miserable and wretched. The blessed receive mercy. The cursed are condemned without pity. The blessed shall see God. The cursed, they're cut off from his presence. The blessed are sons and daughters of God. The cursed are disowned in disgrace. So every time you realized you are blessed, also realize it's only because he was cursed. Realize that every favor, every mercy, every grace, every kindness was bought by Yeshua's blood. So every gift of God to you should be collected in the box of your heart and taken out and regularly looked at it and treasured uh, and responded to with appreciation and thanksgiving and awe and wonder and humility and praise and worship. Because everything was bought by His blood. Everything was bought by his suffering. And that's why we should simultaneously be both uh, the most broken and the most joyful people. Now concerning God's curse in Deuteronomy 27-28, we find God directing the camp of Israel to divide itself in, into two groups, right? Half the camp is sent to, to Mount Gerizim, uh, and from this mountain they're told to proclaim all the blessings of God upon the people. Uh, that those that fall upon the covenant keeper, they're blessed. And then the half of the cap is sent to Mount Ebal, where they're told to scream out all these curses that will fall upon the covenant breaker. And given our sin nature, I don't have to tell you, I don't think, which camp we naturally would fall into, apart from the deliverance of Messiah. Because we're covenant breakers, not covenant keepers. But here's what we need to understand. God has only ever had one servant, one witness, one champion, one son, one covenant keeper, Yeshua. And that covenant keeper took the place of his brethren according to the flesh, you and me. For we, apart from Messiah at heart, are nothing but vile covenant breakers and rebels. All of us. But in infinite love, according to the divine eternal plan of God, Yeshua, the covenant keeper, took the place of you and I, the covenant breaker, and suffered the curse that was ours. So I'm going to go through briefly 20, Deuteronomy 27-28, uh, see how it applies to Messiah when he became a curse for us, what it really meant, so you can get a better picture of what this really means. 
Now, according to a commentary I recently read from uh, uh, R.C. Sproul, he says, when Messiah from Calvary cried out, this is Matthew 22, 40, 27, 46, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The father replied, the Lord, the Lord your God damns you. And then I'll apply in Deuteronomy 27, 28. This is what happened to Yeshua on the tree when he became a curse for us. Because he took all the curses of the Torah upon himself. The Lord sends upon you, you being the Messiah, curses and confusion and rebuke until you're destroyed and you perish quickly. The Lord smites you with madness and blindness and bewilderment of heart. And you grope about at noon as a blind man gropes in the darkness with none to save you. The Lord delights over you to make you perish and destroy you so you be torn from the land. Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the field. Cursed shall you be when you come in, and cursed shall you be when you go out. The heavens above you will be bronze, the earth beneath you will be iron. You will be a whore and a proverb and a taunt among all the peoples. Then all these curses come upon you and pursue you and overtake you until you're destroyed. Because you would not obey the Lord your God by keeping his commandments and his statutes which he commanded you. These are the curses Yeshua suffered. We take so much of God's grace for granted. As covenant breakers, every day heaven should be screaming at us. Every breath we take by right, uh, we should hear heaven shouting at us, cursed, cursed, cursed. But instead, God the Father poured out all the condemnation that we deserve upon his Son. The perfect, spotless, blameless Son, Yeshua, the Messiah. Yeshua, the Son of God, the covenant keeper, the, the victor, the champion. He comes to take your place. He bears the curse in your place. On the tree, Messiah was cursed as one who sets up an idol. He was cursed as one who dishonors his father and mother. He was cursed as one who moves his neighbor's boundary marker and misleads a blind man on the road. He was cursed as one who distorts justice to an alien and an orphan and a widow. He was cursed as one guilty of every manner of immorality and perversion. He was cursed as one who wounds his neighbor in secret and accepts a bribe to strike down the innocent. He was cursed as one who does not conform with the words of the law by doing them. Proverbs 26, verse 2. Like a fluttering sparrow or a darting swallow. A curse without a cause does not alight. So how did a curse alight upon Yeshua, the sinless branch? Only because the branch took my place and your place and bore your sin and mine. The curse did alight upon Yeshua, not because of some flaw in his character, but because he bore the sins of his people and carried their iniquity before the judgment seat of God, before the bar. And there he stood, uncovered, unprotected, vulnerable to every recourse of divine judgment upon us being heaped on him. Psalm 32, verse 1. How blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. How blessed is he whose, the, who, uh, whose sin the Lord does not count against him, in whose spirit there is no deceit. Yet on the tree, on Calvary, all the sins imputed to Yeshua was ex were exposed before God and all of heaven. He was placarded before men. I mean, a spectacle before angels and devils alike. The transgressions he bore were not forgiven him. And the sins he carried were not covered. If a man is blessed because iniquity is not imputed to him, then Messiah was cursed beyond measure. Because as Isaiah 53, 6 says, the iniquity of us all fell on him. Isaiah 53, verse 6. Put that in the overhead, please. In renewal of the covenant at Moab, we hear this. This is a warning uh, given to Israel. I'll be guiding the covenant breaker. Uh, I'm going to do around me 29 on the overheads. We got the overheads mixed up, I think. Uh, this is one who disobeys the law of God. Deuteronomy 29, 20. The anger of the Lord and his jealousy will burn against that man. And every curse written in this book will rest upon him. And the Lord will blot out his name from under heaven. 
and the Lord will single him out for adversity from all the tribes of Israel, according to all the curses of the covenant which are written in this book of the law. Note what this is saying. Note what it's saying now. If you're not in Messiah Yeshua, uh, having given your life to him, then on the day of judgment, you will be singled out for adversity. And don't think you can stand on your own. You will melt before the Lord like a tiny wax figurine before a blast furnace. We must run to Messiah today. He is our advocate. Look at the famous ironic benediction we recite every week, or number 624. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Now, on the natural level, this blessing is impossible. For how can God bless sinners like this? Because he'd be breaking his own covenant. It's only because on the cross, on the tree, the, the only one who deserved such a blessing from God was the one who carried the curse on our behalf, that we might be blessed. Let's look further. Let's go to the Garden of Gethsemane the night before uh, the crucifixion. You know, sadly, a lot of people, even a lot of preachers, think that our sins were atoned for because the Romans beat up and tortured Yeshua. That has nothing to do with the atonement. When in the Garden of Gethsemane, Yeshua prayed, let this cup pass from me, he was not referring to his torture and physical crucifixion the next day. So many people think this cup was a picture of, of the Roman scourging and the beating and the crown of thorns and the mockery, uh, the nailing of his hands and feet upon the cross. And, and this premonition is what caused him to sweat great drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. Nothing could be further from the truth. This explanation, this is the whole point of Yeshua's suffering and death. Indeed, for the next three centuries, Thousands of Yeshua followers were equally tortured and beaten and killed. Many in even more gruesome matters, ma manners. Some were covered with pitch and lit on fire as human torches. Some were thrown to lions or, or killed for sport by gladiators in the Colosseum. Some were crucified upside down. Many were crucified and slowly left to die for many, many days to prolong the agony. And yet... History tells us that they, by the thousands, went to their deaths singing and praying and praising God that they were deemed worthy to die for Yeshua's namesake. So are we to think that this champion of our salvation, Yeshua himself, is now cowering in the garden? No. So what was in that cup that caused him to sweat great Drops of blood. Psalm 75, verse 8. For the cup is in the hand of the Lord, and the wine foams. It's well mixed, and he pours it out, uh, and all the wicked of the earth drink it down to its very dregs. Jeremiah 25, 15. Thus saith the Lord, Take from my hand this cup, filled with the wine of my wrath. Make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. When they drink it, they will stagger and go mad because of the sword I'll send among them. When Yeshua said, let this cup pass, he wasn't talking about Roman torture. No, he was talking about the cup of God's wrath. Why wrath? Because when Yeshua took our sins upon him, God had to judge that sin by judging his son. That's how Yeshua won our atonement. Not by Roman torture, but by taking on the sin and the suffering and the wrath of God in our place that we deserved. Isaiah 53, verse 5. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds were healed. Imagine you're living in, in a tiny little village an eighth of a mile away from, from this massive dam. Uh, the dam is a thousand miles high and a thousand miles wide. And it's filled to the brim with water. And at 1 a.m., all of a sudden, you wake up to the sound like the world cracking in two. And you run to the door, 
You see that the dam has broken. And a wall of water as high as heaven is rushing at you. Your strength of stroke does not matter. How fast you can run is irrelevant. You are going to die, crushed into a thousand pieces. And then, at the very last moment, the ground opens up and drinks down all the water so that not one drop touches your toes. That is the picture of Yeshua drinking the cup of God's wrath on your behalf. On Calvary, on the tree, he took your sin and bore the wrath of Almighty God. Psalm 103, verse 11. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed your transgressions from you. I don't know about you, but I know that my sins are so black that only a work like that could ever save me. Now, you can, maybe you're going to ask, how can one man suffering for a few short hours on a cross save a multitude of men, a countless multitude, from eternal judgment? How is that possible? You want to know how? Because that one man is worth more than all mankind put together. That's how. You take all of mankind, together with all of creation, and put them on one side of the scale. You put Messiah on the other side. He outweighs them all. He outweighs us all. Brothers and sisters, this is the one we pursue. This is the one we follow. This is the one we worship. Go to him. Fall down before him, honor him, praise him, behold his glory. A Puritan writer, John Flavel, he writes this, put this whole series of dialogue in the overhead. And the father speaking from all eternity, and the father says, My son, here's a company of poor, miserable souls who've utterly outdone themselves, and now lie open to my justice. Justice demands satisfaction for their crimes, which will result in their eternal ruin. What shall be done for these souls? Yeshua, the Son of God, replies, O my Father, such is my love to and pity for them, that rather than they should perish eternally, I'll be responsible for them as their surety. Father, bring in all thy bills, that I may see what they owe thee. Lord, bring them all in, that there may be no after-reckonings with them. Do you see this? Perfect atonement, perfect sacrifice, all your spiritual debts, all your sins paid for for the person and work of Yeshua. Yeshua the Son continues, At my hand thou shalt require it. I'd rather choose to, do, to suffer the wrath do them than that, than, than that they should suffer it. Upon me, my Father, upon me be all thy debt. And the Father responds, But my Son, if thou owe to take for them, thou must reckon to pay the very last might. Expect no abatements, son. If I spare them, I'll not spare thee. And the son replies, I'm content, father. Let it be so. Charge it all to me. I'm able to discharge it. And though it prove a kind of undoing to me, and though it impoverish all my riches and empty all my treasures, Yet I'm content to undertake it. That's the atonement. Let me close with this. Perhaps the most famous story in all of the Hebrew scriptures is, of course, the Akeda, uh, the binding of Isaac, uh, Genesis 22. Where God commands Abraham to take his son, his one and only son, his beloved son, Isaac, up to Mount Moriah and offer him there as a sacrifice offering to the Lord. Listen to the, the exact language of the text, Genesis 22, verse 2. Then God said, Take now your son, your only son, the one whom you love, Yitzhak, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I'll show you. And so the burden was laid on the old man, and in both obedience and great sorrow, 
he makes his way towards the mountain with Yitzhak, his son. He prepares the altar in the wood, lays his son on the altar, raises the knife above his head, ready to slay his son. And at the last moment, his hand is stayed. And in Genesis 20 through 12, the angel of the Lord says, don't lay a hand upon the boy. Don't do anything to him. Now I know you fear God because you've not withheld from me your son, your only son. And the substitute is then provided for Isaac, right? This ram uh, caught in the thicket. And Abraham calls the place Adonai Yireh. The Lord will be seen, or some translations, the Lord provides. The Lord provides the ram, uh, the substitute. Now close to 2,000 years later, we see the crucifixion occurring where? In the exact same place, on the exact same mountain. And there hangs God's son. His only son, the one whom he loves, Yeshua. And unlike Abraham, no one stays God's hand. He thrusts the knife into the breast of his own son. Yeshua becomes the one and only perfect sacrifice to pay for your sins. And for the sins of anyone who will repent and trust in him and surrender their life to following Yeshua as their Lord. And so now you and I, were to be ambassadors of this great message, this gospel. Ambassadors of this priceless treasure, this pearl of great price. And so I urge you to seek the Lord, to seek Him with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, that the Lord may reveal more and more of Himself to you and draw you closer and closer to Himself. And you'll grow in holiness. And you'll grow in devotion. And you'll go out and share this good news with everybody you can. For these dry bones, the whole house of Israel, once again shall live. Amen. Let's stand and pray. I'd like the music team to come up. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, thank you today for giving us even this glimpse of the amazing work of redemption uh, for us that you provided by your beloved Son, Yeshua, our Lord. We will never fully appreciate all you did for us, Yeshua. Even if we contemplate it for all eternity, you, Yeshua, are the perfect, spotless, sinless Messiah. Fully God, but also fully man. Tempted in all things like us, but without sin. You are perfect. You have no needs. You're one, been one with the Father and Yeshua for all eternity. And yet you chose to leave your heavenly throne and your splendor, and lower yourself, and strip yourself of your divine glory, and come to earth for us, out of your great, infinite love for us. And then you did the unthinkable. You, the spotless Lamb of God, you became sin for us. It took on all of our mountain of trillions and trillions of sins, all of our self-centeredness, <clears throat> all of our pride, all of our judgmentalism, our, all of our hate and anger and resentment and bitterness, all of our jealousy and spite, all of our greed, our envy, our dishonesty, our violence, our lust and immorality and addiction, all of our impatience and lovelessness and doubt and unbelief and insecurity, all of our mistrust and anxiety, all of our lack of self-control, all of our unkindness and harshness, all of our self-justification and desire for control, all of our evil, and you bore it all as our sacrifice offering, as our Yom Kippur atonement, on our behalf, as our substitute, as our ransom. You suffered the curse that we deserved so that in you we might be redeemed and forgiven and become the righteousness of God. We can never thank you or love you enough, Yeshua. We bow and we worship before you today. We pray all these things in your name, Bashem Yeshua. Amen. Shabbat shalom.